Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and all major podcast providers. So if you can't catch the show live, you can download it or simply use our free podcast player, which is available on our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to connect with us, please post a question on our wall on Facebook or send me a tweet at June Stoyer on Twitter. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by Austria's Finest Naturally, authentic pumpkin seeds and pumpkin seed oil from the Steiermark, available at organicuniverse.com. Listeners of the Organic View can receive $1 off their purchase by using the coupon code ORGVIEW. That's O-R-G-V-I-E-W. Also, don't forget to check out our contest section on our website to submit your information for our free monthly giveaways. For more information, please visit our website at www.theorganicview.com forward slash contests. On today's show, Tom and I have a lot to talk about. Some of the major topics we're going to be discussing are this year's almond pollination, the Zika virus, all these decision to ban neonicotinoids, Cuba's bees, a Senate bill that would name agricultural whistleblowers, and neonicotinoid pesticides that are still being used in Scotland. First, I'd like to welcome to the show my co-host, Colorado beekeeper Tom Theobald. Hello, June, from windy Colorado. We're having high winds the last few days. Yeah, we're getting snow, and I do believe it's going to be in the 50s. So this situation with the weather is really confusing not only the plants, but I can't imagine what it's doing to the bees. Actually, the bees uh, can adapt to a pretty wide range of weather. They can't fly on these windy days, and occasionally there'll be some wind damage, physical wind damage to the colonies, but the bees are pretty resilient. They can tolerate a pretty wide range of conditions. I spoke to Jeff Anderson earlier, who's out in California with the almond pollination, and they're expecting quite a bit of rain, which I'm sure is quite a blessing. But once again, the fluctuation with the weather, the plants don't know what to do. So it'll be interesting to see what actually happens. Actually, the rain can cause problems for the pollination because those almonds are only in bloom for a relatively short period of time, and the bees can't work in the rain. So the almond growers and the beekeepers want as much flight time every day as possible so that they get as good a seed set as they can. And that's going to be a challenge this year because even the colonies that are in the orchards are for the most part undersized. And uh, pollination, I'm afraid, is going to be a challenge. I talked to quite a few beekeepers, and they paint a pretty dark picture as to the health of the colonies. If you talk to someone from industry, they try to make the case that uh, there are plenty of bees to go around. There's no reason to jack the price up, guys, and they'll they'll present the industry position. We'll know within the next week or two just how all this shakes out. I've been told by at least one commercial beekeeper that the almond goers are scrambling for colonies. That seems to be quite a popular problem, and as you said, it'll be interesting to see how things work out. Well, we're beginning to see some of the uh, less desirable characteristics in some of the beekeepers in the United States. There have been quite a few bee thefts in the last two or three weeks, and uh, it's likely to continue. And uh, this could get very tense. It's already very tense. There could be some violence. Well, Tom, can you take a moment and explain to our listeners that are not familiar with the commercial migratory beekeeping process, how hard is it to steal these hives? Actually, it's not hard at all because most of those colonies are set out in the orchards or prior to the bloom, they're in holding yards. And those are in rural, often isolated situations. And someone who knows what they're doing can come in with a a flatbed and a forklift or a semi and a forklift and within a short period of time can do exactly what the beekeeper did to get those bees there. That is, load them onto a semi with uh, the forklift and be gone. It's 
kind of like rustling cattle. You pull into the pasture and you run them into the trailer and away you go. It's a shame that in addition to the issues that commercial migratory beekeepers are dealing with, as far as just trying to maintain their colonies, they now have to deal with theft. This is just ridiculous. Well, this is especially cruel because these beekeepers are struggling to keep their heads above water and keep their operations functional. And uh, this is really kicking someone when they're down. And I'll tell you, if they find these people, they're not going to be dealt with delicately. And I hope that the law finds them and not other beekeepers. And folks, if you'd like to do something to support the commercial migratory beekeepers, please visit pollinatorstewardship.org, which is for the Pollinator Stewardship Council. The organization is founded by some of the most recognized names in commercial beekeeping, especially Jeff Anderson and Steve Ellis. They really need as much support as possible. The Zika virus has been a great concern, and there is a lot of talk about spraying different areas to combat the mosquitoes that are carrying this virus. I'd like to take a moment and go over an FAQ that I found about the Zika virus, which is found on lgstandards-atcc.org. This is what they say. What is Zika virus? Zika virus is a single-stranded RNA virus, and it's transmitted to humans primarily through the bite of an infected mosquito. It was first identified in Uganda in 1947, and they have a lot of other technical information, but it's quite interesting that this is basically what we're dealing with. And if you take a look... At the same website, they also have information about similarities to West Nile virus. Well, you know, we, we've all, we, all become somewhat familiar with the spread of West Nile. And that was how this Zika virus was presented. And it seemed like a repeat of that. But as the evidence is emerging, it may not be quite as clear a connection between the Zika virus and these birth defects as it appears. And there, just within the last few days, there have been a number of competing theories as to what is causing this sudden outbreak of, of birth defects. And it may not be the Zika virus at all. It may be something else. And in fact, it may be an attempt to cover up the Zika virus or who knows what's going on. I don't. Uh, I'm waiting to see what further evidence emerges, but it's become a very curious international issue. It spread for generations through a number of continents without any apparent birth defects, and now all of a sudden we're seeing this. I think we need to pay close attention to how this unfolds. Well, there's a lot of information that you can find on this website which is lgcstandards-atcc.org. And if you do a search for this particular product, which is Zika virus, and mind you, this is a website that sells different cultures and whatnot for the purpose of laboratory research. And it, it, there's quite a lot of information that is quite curious in addition, something that was emailed to us was in regards to the fact that the name of the depositor is Jay Casals from the Rockefeller Foundation. Now, they do a lot of research. Take it for what you will, folks. And if you'd like to learn more about the Zika virus, I highly recommend that you visit the CDC's website. More exciting news is Aldi's decision to ban neonicotinoids. Now, according to MarketWatch.com, Aldi's owns Trader Joe's, and Aldi's is positioning itself to become a key competitor of Whole Foods. Aldi's was initially owned by two Albrecht brothers, one of whom later bought Trader Joe's, and the name Aldi's comes from the family name, 
plus the word discount. So that's how they come out with uh, Aldi. Basically, they'll be removing eight pesticides from all U.S. stores as soon as possible. And I think this is tremendous because it really supports the decision to ban the pesticides in Europe. And it's really taking it to the next level. So this is really a positive step, and it also shows other retailers in America, not only does the public want, but from a business perspective, it makes sense. What do you think, Tom? It's interesting to see these developments uh, in Europe because we're seeing just the opposite here in the United States. There's been a, a fairly significant upsurge, I think, of voluntary labeling when I go to the grocery store, I see more and more products that say GMO free or something to that degree, that extent. But uh, the industry and the Congress and everyone else uh, is still fighting the labeling. The people of the United States do not have the right to know what's in their food. One of the arguments is that it's difficult and expensive and they just can't do it. Well, they have no problem doing it in Europe. These same companies are marketing their products in Europe, and, and they're declaring the contents. It's interesting that the European Union will not accept crops that are contaminated with genetically engineered organisms or with pesticides. So I think it's time for the United States to start taking some action here. It would be nice if this were one of the topics discussed during the presidential candidates debates but of course the decline of the bees food security that's not even on the radar for now so i don't know what it, what it's going to take but it's interesting that the european politicians have made it an issue but yet here in america they don't go near it i think one of the reasons the european politicians may be paying more attention to it is because of the uh, the voice of the european people they're concerned about their diet. They're active in the political arena, and they've bought pressure on their representatives to begin considering some of these questions. Here in the United States, our government is still in the closet. They're still hiding under the bed. They don't want to touch this. This is the third rail of agriculture, and they don't want to get anywhere near this. I think that most of the the presidential candidates are just oblivious. They're not being advised properly by their support people, and uh, I don't think it is going to become a topic of conversation. We're facing something here in Boulder County in the next two weeks. The county commissioners, which is our form of government, will be reconsidering whether genetically modified crops should be allowed on county land. Over the past 20 or 30 years, Boulder County citizens have invested over $300 million dollars in the acquisition of land, and about 20,000 acres of that land is agricultural land, which is leased back to farmers, some second and third generation, and that's appropriate because they're the ones with the skills. But genetically modified crops have crept in, and the uh, concern about what they're doing to the land and to the environment has grown dramatically. And... Uh, so we're facing this question right here in my own home territory about whether or not the genetically modified crops have a place, and if so, what is that place? Well, Tom, I disagree with you. I think the government, I think our elected officials are fully aware of what's going on, and the American people have been quite vocal about this very topic. I know I personally worked with a couple of gals in the state of Connecticut to try to push through GMO labeling, and at the 11th hour, the governor did not support it. I know that there have been a lot of efforts in so many different states to get the labeling passed as well as raising awareness. There's so many different grassroots activists, the Organic Consumers Association, so many different groups that are out there advocating for government officials to step up to the plate and do what the people want. So it's good that it's coming up in Colorado, but once again, it's not being discussed during the presidential debates. I know Hillary is not going to talk about it, especially since she is pro-GMO. 
that's a subject that I think is going to be completely avoided. Well, you may be right, June. I may not be uh, suspicious enough, and they may be well aware of what's going on and just choose to be quiet. In any event, either way, it's a condemnation of the quality of the candidates, I think. I know Trump Chicago was the first to obtain a certification for organic for their in-dining service many years ago. And they were pretty aggressive about it. And it wasn't necessarily Donald Trump personally. It was the people that worked for him. He has very sharp people working for him. And what's really great was the fact that they are only supporting local organic farmers and won't import from China. They, they took a very firm position on that. And this is going back quite a number of years. So... To a certain degree, I think it's something that some of these folks are well aware of, but it's not a focal point, which it should be, because food security is something that is paramount. It's interesting that you would mention China, June, because I think not too long ago, China rejected a huge shipment of, I believe it was corn, because it was contaminated with genetically modified corn. So... I, you know, I don't know what side of the line they're on. They're rejecting some and sending us others. And the fact is that we have just massively poisoned the earth and we have to come to our senses because these are, these are going to only lead us to further and further pesticide applications of harsher and harsher chemicals, and we need to come to our senses. We're beginning now to see serious health problems. I question myself, what kind of a world are we handing down to our children and grandchildren? We should be ashamed of what's happening. Well, a world without bees, basically what we're handing them. It's going to be a world without a lot of other things. The bees are just the symptom. Well, Tom, as you've said time and time again, I hate to quote you, but we are dealing with organized crime. And if you take a look at the the wide-scale use of these chemicals and the fact that there is so much science that proves what the impact is and the fact that it's still legal, they're more toxic than DDT. I mean, I, I could basically repeat everything that you've said and how many shows. But the bottom line is is that uh, I'm just wondering what is it going to take until this becomes the topic that should rightfully take front and center stage? I don't know, June. I don't have those answers, but I'll tell you, I'm very concerned about the way I see things going. We've lost control of our government, and I'm not opposed to industry. I think the corporate model is a good one, but I think there have to be limits set. And the corporations are very good at, at pressing their own objectives, and they have corrupted the regulatory agencies that we've put in place to try to protect us from some of these dangers. They've purchased the government, and I hate to say that. And you look at that slate of candidates that we've been watching now for the past few months, they're all working directly or indirectly for the for the mega industries, the large corporations, and uh, it has to be changed. I'm not smart enough to know what the answers are, but there are people who are much smarter than me who are speaking out, and they need to be listened to much more closely. Well, Tom, maybe it's time that you head south and move to Cuba, because apparently Cuba has added organic honey to its list of key agricultural exports. This is number four. Cuba is known for its cigars and rum, and now apparently honey is a big export because basically they don't use all the pesticides because they have prohibited these companies from going down there and doing the stuff that they've been doing up here, which is quite interesting. It's almost like a kick in the pants. Cuba Cuba is a very interesting laboratory because they've been so isolated for so long. They have developed a form of agriculture which is primarily pesticide-free, and I hope that they preserve that form of agriculture so that we have a standard of comparison for what we're doing everywhere else. My fear is that the 
the corporations are going to rush in there and start selling the chemicals to the Cubans because in their view, it's an unexploited market, I believe. But uh, Cuba is a very interesting potential laboratory, and I hope we use it to good advantage. Speaking of government officials, there's a new Senate bill that's come up that would name agricultural whistleblowers. This is one of the most outrageous things I've ever heard of. Not only would it prevent the truth from coming out, but it would just be a disaster across the board. It's difficult enough now for someone to summon up the courage to blow the whistle on their employer. And these people, like any of us, have their lives invested in careers. They don't want to jeopardize that. But conditions become so bad that they feel compelled to. And to out those people is is only going to diminish the number of people who are willing to step forward. For those of you that have been tuning in recently, several years back, I did an interview with a beekeeper named Terry Ingram, who's located, I do believe, in Illinois. And he was breeding queens that were glyphosate resistant. And lo and behold, one afternoon when he was out running errands, his bees were confiscated. So it just makes you wonder if this is the direction that we move in where basically whistleblowers are revealed. What happened to Terry Ingram is nothing compared to the consequences that some of these whistleblowers might face. As it is, just getting the courage to step up to the plate to say something. Like, for example, Dr. John Lundgren, who recently stood up for what he thought was right, and now he's dealing with the consequences of that, but he is still going strong, and especially with his new endeavor, Blue Dasher Farm, he's doing what a lot of folks should have been doing all along. It's interesting because the area that he got into and got in trouble over is the very topic that we've talked about now for a long, long time, and that's the neonicotinoids, the systemic pesticides and the chemical form of agriculture. And he was one of the few researchers who took it upon themselves to take a look at just what the consequences were. And what he found was the consequences were very negative. And he was a well-regarded researcher until he began to come up with this kind of evidence. And all of a sudden, he gets stepped on every at every turn. And uh, the USDA is an instrument of the chemical companies, and they've revealed themselves quite handsomely with their actions. They've done everything they can to stifle any kind of scrutiny of this family of pesticides. And Dr. Lundgren has taken the hit. And the last topic that we're going to talk about is in regards to the fact that neonicotinoids are still being used in Scotland. This came from a good friend of ours, Graham White, who's a beekeeper over there, and it's just amazing that they're still using these chemicals. Yeah, and Scotland is just representative of most of the rest of the world. They're using them everywhere. They're the most heavily used chemicals in history. And they're used almost everywhere. Here in the United States, we're finding them in the soil at killing levels. We're finding them in the water. We're finding them years after they've been applied. These chemicals are very, very, very toxic. And what we're getting from the people that we've put in place to protect us from these are giving us excuses and diversions and evasions and... That's why we call this a criminal enterprise, and the more we learn about it, the worse it looks, not better. And unfortunately, the same rhetoric that they use to justify the use of these chemicals is basically the same rhetoric that they're using in Scotland. The farmers are saying that if they stop using them, that it could be premature and damaging. And once again, it's the same industry spiel. So hopefully... What's transpired in many parts of the world where they're banning these chemicals will inevitably happen in the agricultural land there. Well, even here in the United States, June, we have found that uh, 
the systemic pesticides are uh, effective only in about 10% of the cases, and one of those studies came from the EPA itself. This is very, very expensive crop insurance that may be beneficial 10% or less of the time, but become but comes at the massive environmental destruction that we've witnessed over the past 20 years. Well, Tom, all we could do is just continue to explore these issues as we do every week. And on that note, I just want to say thank you for joining me today. Well, thank you, June, for hosting this, for giving us an opportunity to speak before the public. Tune in each week as Tom and I continue to explore the impact of neonicotinoids on the environment. And please check out the previous segments that we've done, which are available on theorganicview.com. Thank you for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon.